I'm Gerald Hart, past president of ASBMB and a professor at the University of Georgia. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce this year's winner of the Herb Tabor Award, Professor Kevin Campbell, University of Iowa College of Medicine and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. As most of you know, this award honors a remarkable man who served as editor-in-chief editor of the Journal of Biological Chemistry for more than 41 years. Dr. Tabor was also a world leader in the study of polyamines, and he has the distinction of, of being the longest serving employee at the National Institutes of Health forever. I mean, he, uh, he was worked there for 71 years. Dr. Tabor also pioneered the conversion of JBC from print only to online only in 1995, making JBC one of the earliest online journals in the biological sciences. Unfortunately, Dr. Tabor passed away in August, 2020 at the ripe old age of 101. Kevin Campbell, the 2020 Herb Tabor Award winner is widely recognized for pioneering work in muscular, muscular dystrophy. He discovered the protein dystroglycan and established its roles as an extracellular matrix receptor at neuromuscular junctions, junctions. Dr. Campbell's laboratory elucidated the key roles of glycans in dystroglycan and established the genetic and molecular basis of defects in various types of muscular dystrophy. As a result of his pioneering work, he has received many awards, including an election to the National Academy of Science in 2004. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Campbell, and we look forward to what undoubtedly will be an outstanding lecture. Good morning. I'd like to thank Jerry Hart for his very generous introduction and the ASBMB Awards Committee for being selected as a 2020 recipient of the Herb Tabor Research Award and Lectureship. I am extremely honored to receive this award, which is named after Herb Tabor, who I greatly admire. I have known Herb Tabor since my postdoctoral studies in David McLennan's lab. I can still remember how excited I felt when signing a letter to Herb upon submitting a paper to the Journal of Biological Chemistry. As you can see in this slide, I still have some of those letters I sent to Herb back in the 1980s. At that time, I felt, and I still do, that Herb Tabor read all the papers I submitted to JBC. So today, I would like to thank Herb for being my JBC mentor for many years. He was a great mentor and his passing is a great loss to, to the JBC community. The title of my lecture today is Structural Basis of District Lichen Function and the Pathogenesis of Muscular Dystrophy. These are the disclosures I have. For today, I'd like to first introduce the audience to District Lichen, then discuss the post-translational processing of District Lichen and its glycosylation, which is required for it to function as an ECM receptor. I will then present matrix glycan and its structural interactions with ECM proteins containing laminin G-like domain proteins. And finally, I will discuss some recent data on POMK regulation of large one mediated elongation of matrix glycan. So to begin, Dystroglycan is a widely expressed cell membrane receptor for laminin G domain containing ECM proteins, such as laminin, agrin, and perlecan. It is also the cellular receptor for arenaviruses, such as Lassa fever and LCMV. In general, it maintains and organizes basement membranes by binding these ECM ligands with very high affinity. It's involved in various developmental and physiological processes and especially in muscle and brain. And it requires extensive oglycosylation and post-translational processing for its ECM receptor function. Upon cloning district glycan, we realized that it is synthesized as a pre-pro protein. During its initial synthesis, the signal peptide is removed and it auto cleaves itself into two portions, which we named alpha and beta district glycan. Beta dystroglycan has a single transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic tail that interacts with proteins like dystrophin. Alpha dystroglycan has three domains, an N-terminal domain, a mucine domain, and a C-terminal domain. 
The mucine domain is heavily glycosylated, both N and O linked glycosylation. And in the mature molecule is, uh, makes up around 50% of the protein. The protein also has N linked glycosylation. The N terminal domain is cleaved upon furin with furin and is removed in the final product. So the alpha dystroglycan that's expressed at the cell surface has the mucine domain and the C-terminal domain. A major functional glycosylation is the modification by an enzyme called LODGE, which is illustrated here. And there are two or three sites on the mucine domain that get modified by LODGE. The functional glycosylation of dystroglycan requires over 18 different enzymes. I'm just illustrating a few of those enzymes here most of the other enzymes are involved in providing substrate for this process. It begins by uh, uh, glycosylation of uh, putting an O mannose on probably two or three sites on a serine or threonine on dystroglycan with POMT1, POMT2, a complex that puts mannose on. Then POMGNT puts a GUCNAC on and following B3 gallon T2 puts GALNAC. Once this trisaccharide is formed, POMK phosphorylates mannose in the sixth position. We then have Bucatin or FCMD gene product that adds uh, ribose 5-phosphate and then FKRP adds another ribose phosphate. Once this is added, then TME5 and B4GAT1 add a xylose and glucuronic acid. And this is an acceptor substrate for the enzyme LODGE. LODGE then adds a polysaccharide of repeating units of xylose and glucuronic acid, which we call matriglycan. Now, LODGE is the enzyme that we have focused on. Uh, it, it contains a transmembrane domain and two potential active sites. So it, its initial structure suggests that it looked like a bifunctional enzyme. We tagged LODGE, removed the transmembrane domain, and tagged it also with a HIST tag. And you can purify and make a substantial amount of the protein for enzymatic and structural studies. As illustrated here, if you use this uh, preparation of LODGE with two sugars, and if you tag either xylose or glucuronic acid, you produce a polysaccharide of repeating units of xylose and glucuronic acid. We could then purify that polysaccharide, in which we call matriglycan, look at its structure, and also obtain quantities for doing biochemical studies. One of those experiments is shown here. Here we're showing matriglycan binding to the LG45 domain in laminin alpha-2. Matriglycan binds with very high affinity, 0.23 micromolar. And this binding is totally calcium dependent. And this is similar to what we had previously seen for the binding of laminin to alpha dystroglycan on extracts. This calcium dependence is due to the calcium that's bound in the LG45 domain. We then collaborated with Erhard Hohenhester to show the structure of the interaction site between matriglycan and the LG4 domain. As illustrated here, the disaccharide of xylose and glucuronic acid chelate the calcium and interact with the backbone on laminin to form this high affinity interaction. So the, this, the single disaccharide is required for this high affinity interaction. So in summary, LODGE is a bifunctional glycosyl transferase that has both xylose transferase and glucuronic acid transferase activities. LODGE produces matriglycan, a polysaccharide that consists of repeating units of xylose and glucuronic acid. The, this single disaccharide directly binds to the LG domain containing ligands, and matriglycan serves as a tunable scaffold, which I'll discuss more later. So this is now an illustration showing the, the extended structure of matriglycan. We really still do not know the total number of repeats, likely it's 30 or 40 repeats of xylose and glucuronic acid. And this is the initial synthesis of the precursor molecule glycans that are required for initiating matriglycan synthesis. Now, this extended structure, it can be variable depending on which tissue you're looking at. So skeletal muscle, the, the band centers around 150 kilobones. In heart, the matriglycan is longer, the molecular weight of dystroglycan is around 200. Uh, in brain, it's around 100 kilobones. In other tissues, it also varies. The binding to laminin also varies, and the higher molecular weight has the higher capacity binding uh, to laminin. During uh, myogenesis, if you take C2, C12 cells and, and uh, let them form myotubes, you can see the expression and the length of matriglycan increases 
uh, during myogenesis, let's see an alpha DG, where the beta DG uh, remains constant. It, it increases in expression, but its size does not change. Now the best characterized form of dystroglycan is from skeletal muscle, where we isolate it in a complex with the strophin, the sulfoglycans, and some cytoplasmic uh, cytoskeletal proteins. If you look at the, this complex in muscle where dystrophin is missing in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, illustrated here, the absence of dystrophin, the entire DGC complex, including the alpha and beta dystroglycan, are dramatically reduced. So without dystrophin, this complex is probably not stable and gets degraded. Now, this complex is also the site for other forms of muscular dystrophy. If you're missing laminin 2, the muscle form of laminin leads to a congenital form of muscular dystrophy. The sarcoglycans lead to several different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And finally, what I'll be discussing today, the abnormalities in matriglycan synthesis or the reduction in matriglycan synthesis leads to the dystroglycanopathies. So the dystroglycanopathies were originally described as very severe uh, Walker-Warburg -Warber -Walker syndrome-like dystrophies. However, now we know there's really a spectrum of phenotypes from milder limb girdle muscular dystrophy through uh, congenital muscular dystrophy with or without brain involvement, muscle eye brain disease. So there's a really a range of clinical phenotypes. And they're all caused by a deficiency in matriglycan that is required for dystroglycan to function. Illustration here, illustrated here is an example of immunofluorescent staining with antibodies to beta dystroglycan, to the core protein of alpha dystroglycan, and to matriglycan. These are two antibodies that we developed. Originally, we, we thought they were just recognizing the unglycosylated form of dystroglycan. We now know they bind specifically to matriglycan. So in control muscle, the beta dystroglycan is surrounding each muscle fiber. Same thing is true in muscle eye brain disease. If you look at the core protein, you see the core proteins expressed in control and in the, the dystroglycanopathy biopsy. However, matriglycan is almost completely absent in these cases. We've also developed an assay where we can use patients' uh, fibroblasts. These are skin fibroblasts from patients. Here we're illustrating in control fibroblasts, nice uh, alpha dystroglycan, nice synthesis of matriglycan, laminin binding, and the core proteins. In these five, six cases, we're dealing with very severe phenotypes where there's almost no activity of these enzymes, POMT1, POMT2, POMGNT1, glucotin, and FKRP and large. And there's no glycosylated dystroglycan, no matriglycan is expressed, no laminin binding. However, the core proteins are, are present. So this illustrates quite nicely a technique that can be used for diagnostics uh, because it, it uh, alleviates the need for a muscle biopsy. At this around the same time, we found a mouse model that was missing large. This mouse had, had been in Jackson Labs for a number of years, and it has the same phenotype as we've seen before. But there's no staining with the anti-matric glycan antibodies. There's no staining here on Western blots, and there's no laminin binding. Now, th there's a question that comes up sometimes, are there mutations in dystroglycan? And most cases, if dystroglycan has a loss of, of function or a loss of protein expression, it's probably lethal. Uh, we know in the mouse model, dystroglycan is required for uh, the formation of Reichert's membrane very early in development. But there are mutations, uh, in, milder mutations in dystroglycan. This is the case where there's mutation in the N-terminal domain, which was quite surprising to us because this is the domain on dystroglycan that's removed by furin. This patient had a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, had CNS abnormalities, high CK, and was in a conserved residue in the N-terminal domain. When we made this mutation in dystroglycan and expressed this form of dystroglycan in dystroglycan null myoblast, we found wild type expressed nice uh, staining with 2H6, the anti matriglycan antibody. However, the mutation was, is, was dramatically reduced. The same thing was found for the laminin binding. So in this case, there's a mutation in the protein that leads to the hypoglycosylation or the reduction in matriglycan uh, synthesis. I mean, we now know that this, this form of dystroglycan, the DGN or the N-terminal domain of dystroglycan interacts with large. And so without this interaction, there's a dramatic reduction in the synthesis of matriglycan. This is an important case because it illustrates uh, a case where all the other enzymes are normal they're all expressed at normal levels. However, the defect is actually in this interaction between large and dystroglycan. So in summary, the dystroglycans are muscular dystrophies caused by abnormal matriglycan uh, synthesis on dystroglycan. So in normal skeletal muscle, this complex of proteins 
uh, is it links the cytoskeleton through the strophin, through the membrane into the basement membrane that surrounds the muscle cell. And it's involved in maintaining muscle membrane integrity. It's also expressed and involved in the structure of the neuromuscular junction. It's involved in force transmission and in muscle regeneration. In the district lichenopathies, the entire complex is expressed. We've demonstrated this in the MYD uh, mouse model. But however, with the absence of matriglycan, we no longer link into the basement membrane that surround the cells. And it leads to these various forms of district lichenopathy. So now it's quite easy to see without large, you wouldn't synthesize matriglycan, you'd end up with the, this the large primer. And so you wouldn't have a functional molecule. Without FKRP, you wouldn't synthesize the precursor or this, the second ribotol phosphate. And again, you would end up with uh, uh, the lack of matriglycan and the loss of function in districtglycan. However, POMK is quite unique. POMK phosphorylates mannose, and we really weren't sure what would the structure be without POMK. Would we get synthesis of a partial form or would there be no synthesis of matriglycan? And so we're quite interested in POMK. It's another one of the unique gene products in the, this pathway. It's a glycosylation specific kinase in the ER. It uses you know, non-canonical amino acids. So it forms these three disulfide bridges in the ER to form a structure like a, 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 the A kinase. And it phosphorylates the, the uh, district glycan on mannose uh, to initiate the synthesis of matrix glycan. Illustrating the specificity is shown here. If you start off with a fluorescently tagged mannose plus a minus ATP, POMK doesn't really do anything. If you have the disaccharide, there's no reaction. However, once you form the trisaccharide, mannose gets phosphorylated. So it has high specificity for th this uh, trisaccharide. Our studies really got a boost when we found this patient uh, from Francesco Montoni that had a loss of function mutation in POMK, suggesting like, with the, as with the other enzymes, this patient should have a very severe phenotype. However, this patient uh, uh, actually lived to around th uh, three years of age. This patient had a mutation uh, at, one, at the active site. So we would you know, think it, this patient would have no activity. And we actually confirmed that using fibroblasts from the patient, there was no POMK activity. In skeletal muscle extracts from the patient, there was no activity. However, when we did immunofluorescence staining, unlike other patients which were totally deficient in matriglycan, we found this patchy staining on the muscle fiber. When we did Western blotting, we found that instead of a 150 kilodalton band, of, of matriglycan, we found something around 90 to 100 kilodalton and in reduced intensity. So this suggested that in the absence of POMK, there was a pathway to synthesize matriglycan. In order to go further, we made a mouse model knocking out POMK in skeletal muscle. And we found the same immunofluorescent staining. While beta districlycan was normal, the mice exhibited you know, a, a muscular dystrophy histology phenotype However, the staining with 2H6 wasn't null, it was patchy. And this illustrated again that there's a matrix glycan being synthesized in the absence of POMK. This shows the, the absence of activity. There's a small amount of activity probably due to some contaminating tissue such as nerve. Oh, this is a muscle specific knockout. Um, and the mice have an elevated uh, CK. Now, when we did Western blotting of the extracts from these mice, we found the core protein that beta glycan was equal. However, alpha glycan core protein was reduced in size like we saw previously in the patients. When we do a laminin overlay or we stain for the anti-matriglycan, we find there's a reduction in size and a band around 190 to 100 kilodalton like we saw in the patient. So again, we're finding a smaller matriglycan in the absence of POMK. So this illustrates a cartoon model of what we think we're seeing in the absence of POMK, that we form a trisaccharide and that this trisaccharide can produce some uh, precursor molecule. And that uh, is then allows large to act on it and form a short matriglycan. So in the absence of POMK, we're getting a reduced synthesis of matriglycan. To really prove that what we find on the POMK alpha glycan is matriglycan, we use two enzymes that could remove xylose and glucuronic acid. So we treat the, the, the protein with these two enzymes to remove the polysaccharide chain. And that result is illustrated here. In wild type, we're staining around 150 kilodaltons, really intense. After treatment with the two enzymes, it's dramatically reduced. We've removed the, the, the xylose glucuronic acid. We've removed matriglycan. In the POMK muscle, 
banned around 100 kilodaltons, and upon treatment with the enzymes, uh, the staining totally disappears. Major glycan is lost. We can also confirm this with laminin binding uh, from the POMK muscle. It's dramatically reduced. And this also illustrates that this shorter form of major glycan can bind a laminin. We next went to use HAP POMK knockout cells. We can see here that these cells have no POMK activity and they produce a band around 90 kilodaltons in size. It's the same with the anti matrix glycan or stains with uh, uh, in the laminin overlay assay. We express in those cells wild type POMK. We can rescue the activity and rescue the normal size uh, matrix glycan. If we express mutants of the active site, we see there's no activity, there's still normal large activity, and we still get this 90 kilodalton band. So this suggests that. Without POMK, we can synthesize the small matrix glycan molecule. We next wanted to see, you know, which enzyme was synthesizing matrix glycan, because there's two, both large one and large two, and where was it definitely being synthesized on district glycan? So to do that, we made double knockout cells of both POMK and large or POMK and DAG1 district glycan. Shown here is the knockout cells with POMK have a nice band of around 90 kilodons in the POMK large one knockout. Uh, cells, this band is totally absent. So the, the synthesis of the short matrix glycan requires large one. If we do POMK district glycan knockout cells, again, the band totally disappears. There's no uh, laminin binding, again, demonstrating that this synthesis of matrix glycan is occurring on uh, alpha district glycan. So this band is alpha district glycan. The laminin binding confirms these results here, showing that the two double knockouts have no binding, whereas the POMK knockout, as we've shown before, has some residual binding, as you can see here in the overlay assay. We next wanted to see uh, if there is a requirement of the, these substrates to go into Fucatin or FKRP. As illustrated here, if you overexpress Fucatin, okay, uh, you get an increase in staining. So this suggests that Fucatin, uh, if it's uh, overexpressed here, will produce more precursor and allow for uh, uh, the extension on matrix glycan. However, the molecular weight does not shift. So we still produce the short matrix glycan, we just produce more of it in the absence of Fucatin. This might explain uh, the, the previous results that suggested that Fucatin required phosphate on POMT1, this mannose phosphate for its activity. So we think in the absence of the mannose phosphate, there's a small amount of Fucatin activity uh, that still can occur to synthesize this shorter form of matrix glycan. However, if we add Fucatin with adenovirus, we can get more activity and we get a more extension, uh, a more production of this short form of matrix glycan. So in summary, we think all of the substrates are required for the synthesis of this short form of matrix glycan and all the enzymes are the same as in the long form. So I'd like to just end with two current questions we have. How does POMK regulate the large mediated elongation of matrix glycan? And what is the physiological role of the extended matrix glycan? And these are questions we're, we're still working on. Now, if you take the cells in the absence of, of, of POMK and express a large one with adenovirus, you get just a small shift in molecular weight. However, if you first express POMK, uh, if you co-express POMK and large, you get this large extension of the matrix glycan. So this demonstrates that the, the molecule needs the, the phosphorylation of mannose to give you this extended glycan and suggests that large possibly interacts directly with the mannose phosphate structure. And that's illustrated here. These are control experiments with POMK, but the large one actually binds to the core M3 phosphate. It binds to the, to the trisaccharide that's phosphorylated um, with high affinity. We next wanted to see, you know, was there, you know, what's the role of this extended glycan? okay, in the physiology of muscle. So the length is, is, is such that we think it could possibly interact with multiple extracellular matrix molecules like laminin, agrin, and perlican, and could be providing some structure to the basement membrane surrounding muscle. Support for that comes from some studies we did years ago on brain, where a basement membrane structure, the glial limitans, was disrupted when we knocked out dystroglycan in the brain. Support also comes from muscle studies. When we knocked out district glycan in, in muscle, we get disruption of the basement membrane. It no longer links to the plasma membrane. There's separations and disorganized basement membrane. So this suggests without POMK, well, without this extended structure, you're gonna have disruption in some function. And so our model working here is that the large glycan on the POMK model 
can bind to some of these molecules, but cannot form a structured base or membrane, but still links across the membrane. And the physiology we, we found uh, so far supports that. So specific force in the POMK knockout is the same. So if the link across the membrane is still there. However, we can induce damage, eccentric contractions, where these lengthening contractions can damage the muscle cells uh, because you no longer have a, a nice intact basement membrane that surrounds the muscle cell. So this illustrates the need for this extended laminin uh, binding matrix glycan in order to have normal physiological function. So the, the physiological implications for this re long repeat is that there are multiple repeats in matrix glycan that can increase the apparent affinity to these extracellular matrix molecules. If, if there are 100 repeats, that could be around 30 kilovolts in size and could span around 150 nanom nanometers in length. So it really could possibly bind to more than one molecule. And finally, the, the assembly of this complex is quite critical for normal uh, function in muscle. So I, today I presented our work on muscle, but I just like to remind you that this glycan is, is a receptor in other cell types and it has physiological functions in these other cell types as illustrated here. So to end with, I mentioned some of our collaborators, uh, Jack Dixon, uh, Erhard Hohenhester, uh, Stefan Kunz, uh, Michael Olstone, Harry Schachter, Lance Wells, and Francesco Montoni, and my collaborators at Iowa, Kathy Matthews and Steve Moore. And I finally like to thank the lab members from my postdoc days in David McLennan's lab, uh, the current lab members in the Campbell lab, and then I'll quickly show you the initial district liking crew at Iowa and lab members over the years that have contributed to all of this work and have been really uh, great trainees and really have supported everything that I presented today. Thank you, and I'll end there. <laughs>